Acts chapter 16 and Luke chapter 6. This will be our jumping off spot. We'll be in several different places today. Acts chapter 16, look at verse number 31. Back up to verse 30. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. That's a great verse. And let's go over to Luke chapter 6, and verse number 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. Father, I pray you bless the time in your word this morning. I pray we could get some instruction and some help from the scriptures. Lord, I pray that as we deal with some doctrine, Lord, that you may help us to make sure we know what's true and what's right. We need to have the facts right. If we're going to have the right faith, we need to have the right faith and the right facts. God, I pray that you'd help us with these matters. Maybe give some assurance and some comfort to someone and if they're doubting their salvation, and for somebody that maybe they're not saved, I pray that they would understand the clear gospel and be saved before it's too late. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for the scriptures that we can always go to that never change. We can trust them. And I pray you'd help us to believe them in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Uh, this morning will be a little bit different. I would like to do a little, maybe a little more teaching than preaching this morning. And I would like to deal with some doctrine, some Bible doctrine, you know, and in our age, we have a lot of good preachers and good speakers. And somebody can be a very good speaker. They maybe have a good commanding voice. And maybe they have good oratory skills. And <clears throat> they can say things and present things in a good way, in an entertaining way. Maybe an educational way. But if what they're saying is not right and true, it really doesn't matter how emotional they are. Somebody can get a Bible and wave it all around, and they can spit, and they can hack, or they can get a Bible, and they can tuck it under their arm, and they can be very polite, and they can be very grammatically correct, and command their voice very nicely, and make you feel good. But if what they're saying is not true, it doesn't matter how good of a speaker someone is, it doesn't matter how good of a thrill that it brings to you as you listen to them. I want to preach a little bit some about doctrine this morning, because I'm afraid that a lot of us, and I'm not getting on to you, Maybe you don't come to Sunday school, you don't think it's a big deal to maybe study a lot, and you just like to hear preaching. A lot of times we come in here and we preach devotional stuff, and it's good, you need that. You need to have some devotional application. But if you don't understand some basic Bible doctrine, you don't know which way is up. Do you really know this morning why you are a Baptist? Are you a Baptist by conviction, or is this church just closer than the other one? Do you know why you believe what you believe? Or do you just, well, that's what your granddaddy believed, and so now that's what you are. So I want to try to help you this morning, hopefully with a little Bible doctrine. I want to deal with an issue that's even in our circles oftentimes, and it's a heresy. It's the heresy of lordship salvation. And you say, well, I don't know that term, and well, we may talk some. I'm not going to deal with the theologians and give you all that kind of stuff and talk, you know, it's really a, a part of theology that's called soteriology, which means the study of salvation. There's no need to go through and give you all this stuff. We're going to stew it down and give it over the plate like you would hear it. And like you would hear somebody preach this and teach this stuff. And we're going to go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about it. You say, preacher, I don't know what this is, what this means. Well, we're going to talk about it. It's a theological issue. But there are two reasons I want to bring this up. Number one is it's an issue of salvation. People are told, being told how to be saved incorrectly. It's an issue of salvation. Number two, it's an issue of assurance. People that are saved oftentimes are talked out of their salvation because of the heresy of lordship salvation. And uh, we don't believe in, Brother Chris was preaching to the young people, they're not about retreaders. Now, I don't know that people are familiar years ago, and they still do it on the big trucks, I guess. They put treads around instead of fixing the whole tire, you know. 
and you retread the tire instead of getting rid of the old thing, you just retread it. Well, we make fun of some of these preachers that they try to talk you out of your salvation so they can get some more people saved, so they can report on their little tweet and their little Facebook page how great of a revival it was, where if you went to the revival, it didn't sound nothing like that guy talked about it. But he wanted his image because now he has an image that's not real because it's fake book, not, you know, I mean, face, fake. It's an image he's putting out there for people to perceive of him, so then he retreads everybody to get them saved all over again. And so it's number one, it's an issue of salvation. Number two, it's an issue of assurance. Some people are saved and they doubt they're saved because of this doctrine and how this doctrine is preached. And I'm going to give you the, here's an easy way to remember it. I won't tell the sheriff to stand up, but think about it this way. And he probably wouldn't say he's a cop anyway, but that word cop is used. You think about cop. That's how you can learn the doctrine of lordship salvation. Number one, C. Number two is O. And number three is P. C, it stands for commitment. Lordship salvation teaches this. One must not only believe in Jesus as the Savior, one must yield his life to Jesus as Lord of his life. A person can believe in Jesus for everlasting life and not be saved because that faith must be joined by a commitment to serve Him for their entire life. Commitment. Lordship salvation pushes a commitment to Christ. You may hear them pray. They may lead someone in a sinner's prayer like this. God, I turn from my sins and I commit my life to you as my Lord and Savior. I'm inviting you to be the Lord of my life. That's what you'll hear oftentimes. Or you may hear, Lord, I repent of all my sins and give them up for you. That's called that's a, that's a commitment. I'm going to give you a few cliches as we go along here. Uh, number two, the second one will be O, which would be obedience. This is the second in the doctrine of lordship salvation. It means there's an initial commitment to Christ, but it must be followed by ongoing obedience to Jesus. There's no salvation apart from obedience with the doctrine of lordship salvation. Obedience proves one is truly saved. If you're not living the life, then you're just talking to talk. You never were saved. So if I get up here and preach and you haven't been in church in a year, then you need to get saved. Surely if you were obeying Christ, you'd be in church every day, every time the doors were open, right? Here's a great quote that they use. We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. And some of this stuff, and the reason I'm preaching this is because if you're not trained in the Scriptures and you don't have your doctrine right, this stuff will sound good. And it'll sound maybe right, and you can fall prey to it. Lordship teaches that the grace of God and salvation not only forgives, but it transforms. And I have a moth on my Bible. He's a dead... Oh, man. I am not... I have guts all over Luke chapter 6, verse 8. Dog. I don't have any stains in this Bible. See, I was, I was trying to be all proper and giving a lecture it never works for me i can never be i can never be at a first baptist church see i had my thing button too i'm all scholarly let me, let me get past the guts page i'll never forget that on my bible when i'm reading through my bible and i see that guts i'll remember that's just the temptation of a, of a boy inside of me. You see a moth, you thump him. That's just what you do. You thump him. Where were we at? Obedience. Here's lordship salvation. The grace of God and salvation not only forgives but transforms and a lack of obedience or transformation in a person's life is warrant to doubt that they've been truly born again. Here's what they'll say to unsaved people when they give the plan of salvation. You need to get right with God. Sounds good. Unsaved people, you need to get right with God. No, they need to get saved. Nobody, a person that's not saved can't get right with God. There are all kinds of people that are unsaved and they're keeping the commandments. Don't cheat, don't lie, don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't, don't spit, don't go with those that do. Good people. Supposedly right with God. You've got to watch that stuff. So who do you tell to get right with God? Backslidden Christians. That's who you tell to get right with God. 
Here's a real popular one. I've heard this preached many times. If there's no change, there's no change. When I got saved, I put down the cigarettes the next day. I quit the drinking the next day. If you didn't do that, you never were saved. You'll hear stuff like that preached. Well, they hammer it too. Of course, they never preach on envy like that. When I got saved, I didn't quit all my envying. I didn't quit all my lust. I didn't quit all my jealousy. Maybe my gossiping. Maybe my laziness. We don't believe in faith and works, but a faith that works. Here's the best one. If Jesus is not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. <sighs> so you making fun of those guys? Absolutely. I'd walk right by them looking for a real preacher. Or a real, I should say, a real Bible student. Some of those guys, you know, they preach good stuff. If they don't get hung up on this. Here's Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, great preacher from yesteryear. And he was messed up on doctrine. He said this, quote, If the professed convert distinctly and deliberately declares that he knows the Lord's will, but does not mean to attend to it, you are not to pamper his presumption. It is your duty to assure him that he's not saved. How many of you know to do good, but you don't always do it? Anybody in here? Well, you're on your way to hell. According to Charles Spurgeon. So that's the O, obedience. Then we have the P. What is the P? The P is perseverance. Not preservation, but perseverance. Lordship salvation believes a commitment must result in obedience that turns to perseverance. In other words, by the time you're 80, when you got saved when you were 10... You have persevered all through the years. You've had that commitment from the beginning and you've obeyed every single year, every minute, all the way up to that point. You have persevered to the end. You have not stopped obeying God, so therefore you will never go to hell. Now, there are two views on this, and this is where it branches off. Number one, you have the Calvinistic position, which will be your Presbyterian, Reformed, Hardshell Baptist, those types of things. Then you would have your Arminian position, which will be your Methodists and Wesleyans and, and the Nazarenes and, and Holiness and Church of God and that kind of position. The Calvinists will say this, if you don't persevere to the end, if by the time you're 80, you quit reading your Bible and maybe you're not on fire like you were used to be and you're not obeying the Lord, then... You were never one of the elect. You just deceived yourself all those years. You thought that you were one of the elect, but you're one of the reprobate. The doctrine of election and the doctrine of reprobation, you're going to hell. You never were saved to start with. You just thought you were. That's Calvinism. The other side is Arminianism, and it bleeds over into independent Baptist circles, even though they believe in eternal security. But here's how it bleeds in. Well, let me, let, me, let, me just, let me just scratch that. I'll give you the Arminian position, then I'll give you our little independent Baptist position, which I've already kind of given. Arminian says this, if you quit doing good works, and here you are, and you don't persevere to the end, then what salvation you had, you lost it. You have lost your salvation, and now you're going to hell, because your commitment and obedience did not persevere. That's people that believe you can lose your salvation. Of course, when you go to funerals of people that are Church of God, Assembly of God, they always seem to preach eternal security. There are several problems with this. Number one is the misconception of what sin really is. They just think sin is the outward appearance of things. In other words, you go out and kill somebody, that's a sin. Do you know um, if you think a bad thought, that's a sin? You know, the Bible says, Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. You know, all unrighteousness is sin. Covetousness is a sin. You ever see something that's not yours and you'd like to have it? You sinned. Well, right before somebody dies, what if he covets something and he dies? He means he goes to hell. He lost it. He didn't persevere. Here's how the Baptists get it. No change, no change. See, we believe in eternal security, but if somebody doesn't live up to our standards of what we think is true obedience, which mine would be you have to be in church four times a week. You've got to read your Bible at least three or four times a year, and you've got to win a couple people to Christ a year at least. That's my standard. And you've got to give you know, at least 20% of your income. 
You know, at least, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month of missions. That's my standard. Then if you don't do that, then you just thought you were saved. You never really no change in your life. You're no better than nobody else. So I'm going to retread you. We're going to sing just as I am 35 times until you come down here and get saved. <laughs> now let's break this thing down. Take your Bible and go over to Romans chapter 4. We'll go through some verses. Here's the downfall. I'm going to give you these. You might want to jot them down. First of all, salvation is by faith alone. Look in Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter number 4. Now all of us are affected by this. Like I said, even if you're not affected by the Assembly of God, Church of God, Calvinist, Wesleyan, Methodist, you're affected by Independent Baptists because oftentimes when people have a lack of dispensational understanding, they don't make right divisions in the Bible. Therefore, they have to make everything blend together. And then when they make everything blend together, they have to have a transformation where not just sonship, they have to have discipleship. And they have to have consecration along with being saved. It's all got to blend together in their paradigm because they can't make the division. Look over in Romans chapter 4. The first point to note is that salvation is by faith alone. Romans chapter 4. Look down in verse number 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Let me ask you a question. The thief on the cross, just using it as an illustration. When the thief on the cross died... Did he have a chance to obey Christ? He never had an opportunity. He made a quote-unquote commitment. We're going to talk about that in a second. He didn't get to do any good work. He go to hell? I just don't believe you can be saved and live any way you want to live. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. That deals with chastening of God. and That deals with, with, uh, with, with, a, with a child of God. But here's what the gospel of the grace of God is right here over the plate. And I know you don't like it because you're self-righteous. Those of you who don't like this, you have that little self-righteous where you think that you kind of are worthy of it. Here's the grace of God. The grace of God will find somebody on death row five seconds before they die. And the grace of God will say, do you want in? Do you want forgiveness? The blood of Christ was shed for you. You can be forgiven of everything. You can go to heaven instead of hell. Five seconds before you die. No chance to atone. No chance to make up the wrongs you've done. No chance to say, I'm sorry, to do something good for somebody. No chance to prove that you're good in the eyes of your fellow man. Do you want it? That's the grace of God. It's the same grace that saved you. Because, get this, you were just as bad as that. The grace of God. Salvation by faith alone. Notice Ephesians 2. Flip over. Take a right turn. Keep turning. Galatians, Ephesians 2. Most, most of you are familiar with these passages. So how do you prove you're saved? I got it right here. It's a legal document. This is my birth certificate. I've been born in God's family based on this right here. It tells me if I believe in Christ, I have everlasting life. This is my adoption papers. I've been adopted into God's family. This is my marriage certificate. And one day I'm going to be married to Christ. I'm already a spouse to him. This is my engagement papers, my uh, marriage license. Well, I just don't feel saved. Some of you probably don't feel. The way I look at some of you, you don't look saved. <laughs> I'm glad that I feel saved sometimes. I'm glad the Bible talks about the witness of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad I know outside of the Bible that God's inside of me. You've got to have that experience personally. You see, there's another element. It's not just an intellectual thing. You've got to know that you know on the inside. But it can't be solely based on that. Because what will happen is you'll start looking at you instead of Him. It's about what you do instead of about what He did. Salvation is about not what you did. It's about what He did. Look in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved. It's not being saved. It's not an ongoing thing where I'm going to know when I reach the end and I finally persevere if I make it. 
a true Calvinist, or really, and he, he detests salvation by works because a true Calvinist says a person must really be regenerated. They must be born again before they can even make the choice to receive Christ, which is foolishness. But they actually teach in the end the way that you know you're saved is your good works. So really they have salvation by works in the end. Because how do you know that you're one of the elect? Well, you really don't know until you die. And if you persevered unto the end, then you're saved. The Bible says I'm already saved. Look, we don't believe, and we get accused of the same thing Paul got accused of. Paul was accused, he says, you know, uh, in Romans chapter uh, number 5 and Romans chapter number 6, he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? They were accusing him of lasciviousness and accusing him of saying, oh, you go live any way you want to live and, and, and using the grace of God like that. They accuse, that of a, they accuse us of that. But let me say this. I'm giving a true doctrinal statement. I'm not telling you to do this. You get saved by God's grace and you go out and live wrong and get out of church and do wrong, you're not going to go to hell. I'm not telling you to go out and do that. But not doing those things didn't get you saved, and not doing those things are, are not going to keep you saved. What keeps you is the power of God. You're already saved. You've already been forgiven past, present, and future. That's the grace of Almighty God. you got to get that thing. What happens is, and it, like I said, it gets in our circles. It gets in Bible believers because what happens is they base their everything becomes about experience because they quit reading their Bible. Everything comes about experience because they're not living their life anticipating what God's going to show them out of the Bible and seeing that living book and developing a relationship with Jesus. It all kind of becomes about the past and it becomes about, well, so and so's given his testimony. When was he saved? 30 years ago. Well, I know it's great to talk about your testimony, but every time you preach, you got to go back and preach John 3 16 the same time. Look, I'm not saying we shouldn't preach you know God so loved the world and I'm glad I got saved when I was six but there's a whole lot more to the Christian life than he sought me he bought me he caught me these guys need to get in the Bible and start feeding some people some Bible doctrine so they know they're saved not just because the preacher said they were because they cried when they came to the altar I don't think he really got saved because he didn't show much emotion he got saved down there at the watermelon festival and went and bought a corn dog I just don't think I just don't think you can be saved. Go buy a corn dog right after that. <laughs> I never forget when Brother Steve got saved. He coming down here weeping like a baby. That's a blessing. I like to see the emotionalism. DJ back there, you came up here. I was sitting here praying the invitation. I look up and there's DJ. He's standing up here on the platform. I want to get saved. <laughs> I like to see that. That's good. Some of you, you wouldn't dare come up in front of everybody and do that. You're so embarrassed, but you would sit back in your seat and God would deal with you in your own way. But to turn this whole thing around on us and judging everybody, I just don't believe there's no change. I don't believe he could have left her. I don't believe she could have left him. I don't believe they could have did it to their kids if they were really saved. I got enough blood vessels poking out yet? No change, no change! Man, I've heard it. I've sat in my seat and heard these idiots. And look, I ain't trying to be mean. They're the brethren, you know. They're, in, they're King James independent guys. But look, I can't handle it. I, I get sick to the stomach. It's like, come on, you're going to feed anybody the Bible? You're going to help them grow or you're going to get up here and just do this stuff over? I know, I'll tell you why they do it, because they don't study the Bible and have nothing else to preach. There's a whole lot more to preach in there than no change, no change. All right, uh, one more place, Titus 3. You know these verses. These are good. They teach you about faith. And we're going to go to uh, a few more places. Titus 3. Some of these guys, bless their hearts. You know I'm about to criticize them. <laughs> bless their hearts. They don't know any better. Some of them are proud of their ignorance. They wouldn't read a book on the Bible if you went and gave it to them and bought them a whole collection. They think, well, I just got the Bible. Now, why would you listen to any preachers if you're not going to read a book? I didn't believe in studying. Why are you going to listen to it? Why don't you just, you know, read the sermons by the Apostle Paul? Why listen to any new preaching? They don't want to study. They're lazy. All right, uh, Titus chapter 3, verse number 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, 
by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. All right, so salvation is by faith alone. That's the first thing. That's the downfall of lordship salvation because they don't have it by faith alone. They say there's got to be commitment, there's got to be obedience, and there's got to be perseverance. Okay, number two, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Number two, believers can be either spiritual or carnal according to the Bible. Lordship salvation nullifies this truth. You can be either a spirit. There are, there are two kinds of people in the world, saved or lost. That's the only kind, two kind of people in this age right now. You have saved or lost. I've been speaking some in Sunday school about the difference in Jew and Gentile and church. But in this age right now, a person's either saved or they're unsaved. Jew, Gentile, whatever, they have to either believe in Christ or they say no to Christ. If they believe in Christ, they're saved. If they say no, then they're lost. So you have saved or lost. Between those categories with the saved people, they're either spiritual or carnal. Lordship salvation, you can't have a carnal Christian. Because that means you're not fully committed. That means you're not obeying. That means you're not persevering. You never were saved. Look in 1 Corinthians 1. Let me show you this. 1 Corinthians 1, then we're going to flip over to 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at it with me in verse number 2. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all them that in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. Look at that. They're saints. He's writing to the people at Corinth. They're sanctified in Christ, and they're said to be saints. Look in chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto what? Even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal. Wherefore, as there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Look in chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up and have rather, not rather mourned that he that have done this deed might be taken away from among you. Look at the wickedness going on in this church. So I just don't even believe that guy was saved. When you read 2 Corinthians, he says you forgave him as a brother. The guy was saved. I don't believe somebody can commit fornication and be saved. I don't, somebody, I don't believe somebody can wag their tongue like you wag your tongue and be saved. Where does it stop? Depends on what measure you want to give to sin. Believers can be either spiritual. Let me ask you this. If the prodigal son would have died in the pig pen, would he have went to hell? Well, where was his obedience? If he'd have died before he repented. We'll talk about that in a second. All right, now here's the thing. Look in John chapter number 13. Here's number 3. I'm giving you some ammunition here. Hopefully this is helping. I mean, even if you already believe the truth on this matter, you're going to run into it. And you're going to run in it in all walks of life because people are confused on this. And they hear preachers preach this stuff and you can't, you know, get mad at the folks listening. They're trying to listen and learn from their pastor and they're, they're getting this kind of stuff. But here's another thing you can bring up to show the downfall of this position. John chapter number 13. You know the passage here? This is when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And then, because, uh, you know, when they came into the room, you would think that somebody would have already done this. But they're kind of like, you know, who else is going to do this? And they're, you know, they should have taken the servant's job and they should wash the feet. But they didn't do that, especially the feet of Jesus. So Jesus gets his towel up and he starts washing their feet. He's like, if y'all aren't going to do it, I'll do it. Notice as you go through the passage here, verse number uh, 13. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Did they, did they wash Jesus' feet? No. Was He still their Master and Lord? Verse 13. Yes. Here's number three. Jesus is the Lord of every believer, whether or not they're in submission or not. You've got to get that. He's not Lord of all. He's not Lord at all. I'll get my little organ going over there. You need to pray and invite Him to be the Lord of your life. He's got to be Lord, not just Savior. 
Got these people, they just want Him to be their Savior. They just want a, a fire escape from hell. Well, that's what I got when I got saved. I got a fire escape from hell. And it's the grace of God that helps me to live right and do right so I don't bring reproach on the name of Jesus. Because if it was left up to me, I'd messed up a long time ago. I have messed up. Thank God for His forgiveness. I don't know, I get a little offended when people attack the grace of God. It's God's grace that picked me up out of the miry clay. It's God's grace that set my feet on a solid rock. It's God's grace that gave me a song. It's God's grace that I'm standing here today. Jesus is the Lord of every one of you if you're saved. Whether you're in submission or not. The idea that Jesus is not the Lord if you don't, if you don't believe in this, this doctrine of lordship salvation. He's still Lord. You know, the devil one day is going to confess that he's the Lord. He's going to bow the knee. He's the Lord. Now, here's what they're confusing. There are several subpoints of this, but you want to write these down. First of all, they're confusing belief and obedience. Now, go over to Romans chapter 10. I'll show you this. Romans chapter 10. And here's why this teaching is dangerous, because it's a teaching that is based on biblical verses. And so, a lot of times, you'll have problems and heresies and, and uh, errors in church doctrine because people are actually manipulating Bible verses, and you want to be real careful. That's a dangerous kind. It's one thing for some Muslim to stand out here and say, you know, uh, um, uh, Allah, there's one God, Allah, Muhammad is his prophet, or Joseph, or, or a, a Mormon to stand over here and say, you know, uh, you know, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young are prophets of God. That's one thing. But when somebody says, hey, we believe that Bible just like you do, and they start giving you these verses, that's where you got to watch out. Look over here in Romans chapter number 10. Notice in verse number 16 what obeying the gospel is all about. You know the passage that comes out of the book of Isaiah, verses 13, 14. How shall they preach except they be sent? Verse number 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath kept his works. Obedience isn't being baptized. How many times have you ever heard a pastor say, Well, you need to follow the Lord in obedience and be baptized. I understand what he means. Well, you could say you need to follow the Lord and make sure you put money in the plate. You need to follow the Lord and make sure you witness. You need to follow the Lord and make sure you obey God and read your Bible. You need to follow the Lord and make sure you don't do this and don't do that. And But the people think, oh, obeying the Lord is being baptized. Obeying the gospel, verse number 16, is defined as believing. They confuse belief and repentance. The gospel is not advice to be obeyed as far as do's and don'ts of different things. The gospel is to be believed by faith. And obeying the gospel is believing the gospel. Now here's another thing they confuse, number two under this one. They confuse sonship and fellowship. Sonship, I don't even know that's a word. I kind of invented it. I'm sure I ain't the only one that said it. But sonship is just a good way to think about that. You've been born into God's family. You're born again. You're in God's family. They confuse sonship with fellowship. Okay, you become a son of God by believing in Christ. Get this, because I'm going to hammer this a little bit. You stay in fellowship by confessing your sins. No one gets saved by confessing their sins. Now, I'll chew on that for a minute. Lord, I just say, I'm just confessing all my sins. Well, you don't, you don't even know all your sins, first of all. If you did, you'd probably faint, pass out, <laughs> have a heart attack or stroke. You couldn't possibly recollect and remember all your sins. And for an unsaved person to confess his sins to God, it has no basis for forgiveness because God can't forgive a sinner's sins outside of the blood of Jesus. You will go to hell without the blood. If the blood of Christ hasn't been applied to your soul, your sins are still on you. And when you die, your sins will take you to hell. You will die in an unforgiven state with your sins. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, If you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. When I die, I'm going to die in Christ. I'm not in my sins anymore. I'm in Him. When I got saved, I didn't confess every sin I've ever done. I couldn't remember every sin I've ever done. I was only six or seven. I hadn't done a whole lot. I'm worse now than I was then. <laughs> you'd be honest, you'd be telling the truth. 
two. Okay, sonship and fellowship, they confuse the two. Okay, next, they confuse salvation and discipleship. This is the big thing. Salvation is when you get into God's family. Discipleship is when you serve. Being saved is different than serving. They confuse the two. They confuse the two. Jesus Christ says, if you come to me and you don't hate your mother and father and wife and in your own life also, you cannot be my disciple. So you know what people do? They translate that in. If you don't hate everything and forsake everything, you can't be saved. They confuse salvation with discipleship. Salvation is a free gift. Amen? amen. Say amen, as Oliver Green said. I listen to Oliver Green preaching. He'd be pretty. He goes, say amen right there. He's like, yes, yes, amen, amen. That's scary you have to death, you know. Say amen. Uh, we know salvation is a free gift. God gave you that gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Greatest gift ever given is the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that. We believe that. But discipleship is not free. Discipleship costs. Salvation costs him everything. Salvation costs you nothing. You believed. He gave it to you. He gave you everlasting life. That's why it's so good. But discipleship is a whole other deal. A lot of times we come in here on Sunday morning and I'm preaching and I, we make a devotional application and I'm trying to peel the hide back or the bark back a little bit. Um, it, it's all dealing with discipleship. It's dealing with your fellowship and your serving Jesus Christ and your relationship. Most of the time we're not preaching salvation messages. I don't want you to be confused. Because most of the time there's mostly saved people in here. And we'll mention it from time to time. But if I got in here and just preached how to be saved each and every week, you're never going to learn how to be a disciple. The Bible says the disciples were called Christians at Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse number 26. And what that tells us is everybody who's saved is not a quote-unquote Christian. The word Christian was applied to the people that lived a rigorous discipleship lifestyle. The way they live reflected that they were following the Lord Jesus Christ and they were believers. So you say, well, I'm saved. Okay, but are you a disciple? The people know, hey, that guy, he's a believer. If it's something you've got to put a signboard on and remind everybody, then you might not be a disciple. Not saying you're not saved. So here we really begin to unravel the problem with lordship salvation. They don't make proper division between salvation and discipleship. Discipleship costs everything. It's not easy. Discipleship says, here you go, here's a cross. And on this cross, you're going to die daily. There's going to be things you want to do, and God's going to say, nope, you can't have it, can't do it, sorry. You want to follow me? Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Still want to come? And a lot of the old preachers, you read, I like to read old preachers. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not being disrespectful to people who don't believe, right? I like to read some of these old preachers. But man, buddy, they'd preach it. They'd get discipleship and salvation all mixed like this. They'd have the old mourner's bench. Until you really showed that you repented, really showed how sorry you were, there's no way you could be saved. You're sorry whether you show it or not. Amen. <laughs> They confuse discipleship and, fellow, and, and salvation. And then salvation and surrender. I'll give you a quote from a book called The Lordship of Christ that I have, a little pamphlet. The guy said this, The acceptance of Christ as Lord means also the crucifixion of the old life of selfishness and sin. That is so wrong. Salvation and receiving Christ is not a crucifixion of self. That is something you do as a believer. Paul said, I die daily. He said in Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's not something that goes back to salvation. It's something that deals with your relationship with Jesus Christ as a disciple and following Him. And they mix the two together. Salvation and surrender. See, we can talk about I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. When you got saved, did you give Him everything? Well, maybe you're not saved. It's 
it's amazing how people use this and they just they, they, they strong arm people and they make them get them make them feel guilty and get them you know you didn't really give up everything did you really believe when you believed I don't think you really believed you say you call me Lord Lord and don't do the things that I say where does it stop like I said my standards can get really high Just because your standards are low as an alley cat, where does, the, where does it stop? It doesn't ever stop. So when salvation and surrender become the same thing, then anything goes in lordship salvation. Here's the next one under confusing. They confuse trusting and commitment. Trusting Christ and believing on Christ is letting go. Commitment is holding on. Trusting Christ is letting go to whatever you were holding on to that kept you from Jesus Christ. Mainly pride and self-righteousness. When we talk about repentance in a minute, we're going to talk about what repentance really means instead of penance, like everybody thinks it means. Trusting God is letting go of what, what was holding you. Some people had certain sins that they were holding on to, and until they let those things go and were really willing to say no more, they were not going to open up to Christ. So in that sense, that particular sin was keeping them from Jesus. But no particular sin sends you to hell. It's unbelief in Christ that sends a person to hell in this age. If somebody doesn't... The reason people go to hell is because they don't receive the cure. That's the problem. It's not certain things they do. Here's a person here. He never cheated, never lied on his income taxes, never cheated on his wife, but he dies and goes to hell. Why? He was a good old boy. He died and went to hell because he didn't receive the cure, which is Christ, because he's still a sinner and his sins are still on him. No matter how small those sins might be in comparison to yours or somebody else that you see as a big sinner. Big sinner, little sinner. No, the problem is some of them just get, got caught and we didn't get caught. Some of them just had more guts than we did to pull the trigger and kill somebody and you just cussed them under your breath. Amen. Or guts, I should say gall. Trusting is letting go. Commitment is you holding on to a promise. Will you make a commitment to believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior forever? Will you promise Him that He'll be the Lord of your life? Repeat after me. Now your salvation is based on you making a promise. And if you fail on that promise, you're going to think, oh, I, just, I never was saved. Because I failed. You get into heaven, thank God, is not based on your promise to God. How many times you promised Him something and didn't do it? You're getting to heaven based on what He did, not what you do. Trusting and committing. Commitment costs something, but salvation is free. Then this one, shallow commitment and an unbeliever. They confuse the two. Shallow commitment and an unbeliever. Now, we do have commitment. As far as different things, some people say, Preacher, I'm going to be there every day in Sunday school. I'm going to take notes. I'll be there. And you see them two weeks and you don't see them again. Now, they didn't have to pay for it. See, that's the thing with church. You can get away with a lot of stuff because you're really not, you know, it's just kind of, you slide in here and we're not going to have a roll call and we're not going to make you pay for stuff. And nobody knows whether you're really walking with God or not or reading your Bible or not. I'm not going to get up here and read your Bible reading schedules. Make sure you read your Bible this week or have the quote the verses. Although I think I may do some memory verses here in the next few months. We may put out some memory verses in the bulletin. Maybe we can learn some verses together. But it's not a rigorous type of school setting. So sometimes that, that commitment comes in real shallow. You see... I do believe and I thank God we've got a couple of Sunday school teachers. And guess what? They are here every time unless they absolutely can't be here. And I appreciate that. They actually commit. Let me just go ahead and park here. Do a little devotion. I know we didn't get started until 1130, so y'all just going to have to be hungry. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing to make some commitments. I'm a member of this church. I have a commitment here. I think that's a good thing to make a commitment with some things. You know, we commit with all these other things out in the world, but then things spiritually we don't want to commit to. It's amazing to me. I remember when I first wrote a Bible study course, our big deal was, oh, we need to get this out so people can get it. You know, we just want to give it out to people. and We love people. We want to get people saved and get the Bible. So we sent out these Bible study courses. We put ads in papers and stuff, and we're sending the stuff out, and people ain't turning stuff in because they have their correspondents have to send the stuff back in. They didn't have to pay for it. Didn't, didn't cost them nothing. What's the big deal when you go to 
school don't have to pay nothing. You start enrolling in college and you're actually having to work to pay, you're going to be there when you're supposed to take the test because you're paying for it. The Bible Doctrine Institute, I'm the dean of students there. And we run, we got about 75 active students, men that are training for the ministry and different things. And this past year, we raised, we bumped the tuition up. You say, why? Because you're trying to make money? We don't make none of the money. It ain't about us making money. We raised it up because some of them were being slackers. We said, you know what? They need to pay the price. Somebody hands me a book says, here, read this. I'm reading normally five to ten books at a time all the time. Outside of the Bible, four times, I mean, you know, four times a year, once every three months. So you hand me a book and I'm not interested in it. I'm, it'll go on the back burner. But if I go out and I buy a book, then I'm, I'm interested in that thing. I spend $20, $30, I'm going to read the thing. Once you commit and you invest in something as far as discipleship goes, you take that step. And that's why I want to encourage some of you here. Maybe it's a commitment for church membership. Maybe it's a commitment in your own spiritual life with the Lord. But don't get so confused to think that this commitment, this shallow commitment is an unbeliever. That's what the Lordship people teach. They, they do it inadvertently. Here's somebody and they believe in Christ, but you know, they only make it in on Sunday morning every now and again. As far as we know, they haven't led anybody to Christ and they never sing a special. Their Christianity is pretty shallow. And they don't even put a bumper sticker on their car. So they're probably not saved. Because surely they love Jesus as much as I do. Because I really love Jesus. I'm here every time the doors are open. See how it goes? They mistake shallow commitment with an unbeliever. Let's talk about the levels of commitment. What is the standard? Well, bless God, if you're really saved, if what you... Hey, here's a good one. Here's a good one. I just remember this one. If what you got ain't good enough to get you to church on Sunday night, what makes you think it's going to get you to heaven when you die? <laughs> Boy, I'd preach. Man, I must not be saved. I haven't been to church on Sunday night in a few weeks. I was in the hospital. I should have just got out of the hospital and come in here on my IV. Aren't you glad you don't have to hear that kind of preaching every Sunday? Amen. Those of you who've had to hear that stuff, you know, uh, just loosen up a little bit. Here in Mark chapter 9, you don't have to turn, I'll read it, we're running out of time, I am hungry too. Mark chapter 9, the Bible says, And straightway the father of the tried cr child cried out and said with tears, Mark 9, 24, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. How much do you really believe? You believe your neighbor's going to hell if they die without Christ? Have you been knocking on their door? How much? You see, there's levels of commitment, and you can't mistake levels of commitment with somebody being unsaved. There could be somebody that's saved over here and they hadn't done much for Christ, and somebody here that is saved, and their level of commitment, man, they're sold out. They're all they're both going to heaven. That's salvation, not discipleship. You can say, hey man, this person's doing something for God. This person over here is worthless as far as a Christian goes. Not being mean, but that's just the facts of the matter. As far as commitment and as far as discipleship and as far as selling out to God, they're just sitting on the shelf. They're saved, but there's a difference in salvation and service. What is the standard? Not watching TV? I mean, I mean, this thing can never stop. Well, I don't have, I use email. Well, I don't even use email. Not only do I not use social media, I don't even email. I don't even have a cell phone. Well, I don't even have a car. I ride a bicycle. I walk. <laughs> Where does it stop? We're outside of the Bible at this point. See, what we've done, and here's how the devil's manipulated independent King James only Bible believers, Baptists. I was about to cuss, but I'm not. I meant fun, and then you use the other D word, mentalist. Amen? Because everything's fun is damned, right? You'll get it when you get home. <laughs> everything's wrong. I've heard preaching against Nike tennis shoes. Do you know Nike is a false god? You ever study where Nike comes from? If you wear Nike tennis shoes, I doubt you're even saved. How could you? 
be saved and support idolatry. I've heard it preached, man, I'm telling you. So where does it stop? It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Can't go to a ball game, can't do nothing, man. So here's what the devil's done. He's manipulated into making everything a symbol of outward stuff. So we have all these outward things we look at and we have the levels of commitment and we judge not just whether somebody's saved or not by levels of commitment, but we judge their own spirituality by levels and we've forgotten the whole idea about growth. Somebody can be saved, newly saved, or maybe saved for a few years and they haven't grown a whole lot. And we're so quick like Simon Peter to pull off the sword and get everybody to conform to him being what? Lord... See, Simon Peter's deal was he wanted Jesus to be Lord of everybody. And that man, I'm going to pull my sword off and I'm going to chop your head off if you don't make him Lord. And so I'm not only going to condemn you, I'm going to kill you. And so here comes somebody in and they've not grown a whole lot and they're not as spiritual as you are. The Bible says he that is spiritual, Galatians 6.1, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Instead of doing that, we condemn and we kill and we criticize instead of giving them room to grow up a little bit. You know, with babies, there's a lot of junk you got to deal with. Can I get a witness from some of the parents? There's some nasty stuff you got to deal with. There's some stuff you're like, ooh, I don't... I don't and they get loud and they say stupid things and they and it's just like, why don't you grow up? Give them some time. If you have baby Christians, you got to give them some time to grow up. Don't just say, oh, they're never saved. They had an immature birth or they had a deformed birth. They got born again from a new Bible, so they have a deformed birth in a corruptible seed. I was just teaching a lecture this morning, and we're preaching a little bit. So the levels of commitment, what does the standard go? And then here's the, another thing. I've got to get through this. I'm sorry I'm keeping you long. Well, I'm really not. I'm doing it anyway. I do appreciate you bearing witness, bearing with me here. I don't want to have to preach this again. I want to be done with it. They confuse Jesus' gospel with Paul's gospel. Those of you in Sunday school, we went through some different things with Paul and Jesus. There is a difference between the gospel of the grace of God that's preached after Calvary and the gospel of the kingdom that's preached during the earthly ministry of Christ. I don't have time to go through all the differences, but during that earthly ministry of Christ, the gospel of the kingdom relates to the nation of Israel as to them receiving Christ as their Messiah, and is it, a, it is accompanied by signs and miracles and wonders. And it has to do with keeping the Old Testament commandments, not just faith in the coming Messiah, but faith and works to be saved. Jesus Christ has asked a question in Matthew 19. What must I do to have eternal life? He doesn't say, believe on me as your personal Savior. He says, keep the commandments. The reason when you come to the Gospel of John, you may find some strong indications about belief and some things that we can absolutely apply to the dispensation of grace is because John writes after Paul's epistles are already written. John already has a revelation of Paul's revelation. God brought things back to his remembrance of what Christ said that would have application in this age. And so when you read Paul's gospel, when you read uh, the, the things in, in, in Romans and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and you read Acts 16 when Paul's asked, what must I do to be saved? And he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's different than... If any man come to me and, he's to hate, not, and he doesn't hate his father, mother, and wife, and brother, he can't be my disciple. What must I do to have eternal life? Keep the commandments. It's different. They confuse the two. I'll quote a real prominent preacher, John MacArthur. You've probably heard him on the radio before. Real prominent uh, uh, pastor. Has written a plethora of books. He preaches the Lordship Doctrine. The gospel that Jesus proclaimed was a call to discipleship, a call to follow Him in submissive obedience, not just to make a plea, not just a plea to make a decision or pray a prayer. I can go along with that. Jesus' message liberated people from the bondage of their sin while it confronted and condemned hypocrisy. It was an offer of eternal life and forgiveness for repentant sinners, but at the same time it was a rebuke to outwardly religious people whose lives were devoid of true righteousness. It put sinners on notice that they must turn from sin and embrace God's righteousness. Mm, there's some problems with that. Our Lord's words about eternal life were invariably accompanied by warnings to those who might be tempted to take salvation lightly. He taught that the cost of following Him is high, and that the way is narrow and few that find it. Yeah, but the cost of salvation is not. There is no cost to salvation. 
You can't equate what Jesus was preaching with the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of the grace of God that we preach after Christ has risen from the dead. You can't do it. Like I told you in Sunday school, after Christ rose from the dead, none of those disciples believed in the resurrection. And people have the audacity to say, people like Peter, James, and John, and people before Christ went to the cross, were saved by looking forward to the cross, just like we're saved by looking back to the cross. How can you be saved when you don't believe in the resurrection? They didn't believe in the resurrection. Our gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day from the dead according to the Scriptures. If you believe that, that Christ died for you, had that atoning death on the cross, that He rose again from the dead, you believe in that and you trust in that, you're saved. The disciples didn't believe in that. They tried to stop Him from going to the cross for crying out loud. If they were looking for the cross, they'd be ones trying to crucify Him. And here's another one. I've got to do this. This will be the last one. This is under the, uh, just some of the downfall of Lordship Salvation, the last one. Repentance is not a work. This is the big deals about repentance. Do we preach repentance? Yes, absolutely. We don't preach penance. Penance is you making yourself feel bad. Penance is you taking a brick and hitting yourself over the head because you had a bad thought. Penance is you taking a whip and beating your back and taking a cross and wearing it and walking down the road so everybody can see how holy you are. Let me go get a picture of the man walking on the cross. All the clowns aren't in the circus. Some of them are out on the street walking around with a cross on their back. <laughs> Repentance is not a work. Look in Romans chapter 6. This ought to help you. And see, we'll get accused, and you get accused when you preach like this. They call it easy believism. You believe easy believism. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's easy. You believe on Christ. Amen. You trust Him as your Savior. Well, you don't believe in repentance. No, we believe in repentance. Paul preached repentance. You say, what did he preach? He preached uh, 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 repentance and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance from dead works and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There is repentance. You say, what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. Repentance is not a work. If your salvation is based on repentance and based on you quitting certain sins, where does it stop? Where is the level at? Well, you know, he's a drunkard. He had to quit of being a drunkard. Well, here's a gossiper. Okay, let me ask you this. Be honest. Did you quit every sin when you got saved? Well, maybe you really didn't get saved. You didn't repent of all your sins. Well, I just didn't know about them. Okay, you don't know that you have cancer and you're not going to die? No, it's still going to kill you whether you know about it or not. Well, I just got to repent of all my sins. You don't even know them all. You couldn't, if you tried to confess them all, you'd be here till the kingdom come. Repentance is not a work. It is a change of mind. Faith should produce fruit. I won't argue that point. But you better be real careful being a fruit inspector. Fruit pickers out there. Trying to pick everybody else's fruit and you don't have any either. Maybe that's why you're trying to pick everybody else's fruit. Because you haven't produced any fruit. Don't mistake fruit for the root. Look in Romans 6. Verse 1. Well, back up to five because he was being accused of the same thing we get accused of. You believe in easy believism, somebody can believe and they don't have to repent and they don't have to do this. Well, yeah, absolutely. You don't have to do nothing. There are no strings. God says, come just as you are. I'll take you. So what if I don't ever quit this sin or what if I don't ever quit that sin? Well, let me go ahead and remind you, there's some sins you ain't going to quit till God gives you a new body or till you drop dead. It's the idea, well, I quit all this. Quit. What about the lying and the gossiping and the lust and the... Laziness, the covetousness. We could just go on and on. What about them secret sins there? I know it's easy to have the little list of do's and don'ts on the outside, but it's hard when we start really talking about the spiritual sins on the inside, sins of the mind, sins of the heart that people can't see on the outside. We don't want to repent of those, do we? Romans chapter 5, look at it, verse number um, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, that's Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. 
For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Here's the answer. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Look in verse 3. Know ye not that so many as us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I'm in Christ. I said before, when I die, I'm not going to die in my sins. I'm going to die in Christ. If I'm, die, if I'm in Christ, you know what? I'm crucified with Christ. I mentioned it earlier about dying daily. There's a death that takes place to this. And I'm identifying with Christ. So why should sin have power over me if it didn't have power over Him? That's the point. But notice, if you will, this whole idea about repentance and this whole idea about the levels. This is what I wanted to point out. Verse number 4. We're buried with Him by baptism. That's not talking about water baptism. That's spiritual baptism. When you get saved, you're put inside of Christ. You're spiritually baptized into Him. He comes in you. You go into Him. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, every child of God will walk a transformed life. Doesn't say that, does it? Even so, we also should. Because of what Jesus did for you, you should live right. You should be in church when the doors are open. You should be committed to the things of God. You should be in the Bible. You should be telling people about Christ. You should be living for God. You're not always going to do it. Doesn't mean you're not saved or going to lose your salvation. It means you're a sorry Christian. Repentance is not a work. It's a change of mind. All right, here I'm going. We're talking about food, so this is a good illustration. There are certain things I really believe. I've been convinced. I believe it here and I believe it here. It's bad for me to eat it. Certain things, you know. Like that nice chocolate cake. But you know what happens sometimes? I go buy Chick-fil-A and I can't resist one of them ice creams. Man, you get, even get a little kid's ice cream. It's like that big. I think they're doing you a favor. They're just sending you to an early, early grave. And I, I, I can't resist, and then I eat it, and I'm like, man, I shouldn't have ate that. You believed in Christ, you trusted Christ, you know you're supposed to live for Christ, but you don't. Does that mean because you didn't make Him the Lord of your life? Did you make Him the Lord of your life when you thought that bad thought? Did you make Him the Lord of your life when you said that wrong thing, and you, the tongue went out and said the thing you weren't supposed to say? The Bible says in the multitude of words, there one if not sin. Did you make Him the Lord of every aspect of your life? These guys that are preaching this, they're hypocrites. They didn't make Him the Lord of their life. Not of every aspect of their life. I joked about that song that says, you know, all of my life from that very hour, I've yielded to His control. I've yielded to His control. What's that name of that thing? It is marvelous. It is wonderful. You know the song. I can't ever sing that line because that ain't true. I haven't yielded my life to His control every minute since I've been... I wish I had. You should... But you don't. All right, I'm done. What do you do with what you've heard? Number one, you, if you believe in lordship salvation, you can keep believing in it. It's free country. But what will happen is you'll condemn yourself. You'll live in a spirit of bondage instead of liberty. And you'll condemn yourself and you'll doubt your salvation. And when the preacher gives the invitation, like, man, I wonder if I really got saved. Then you may even make multiple professions of faith. Because you really repented of all your sins that time. And then when the preacher says a prayer for people that aren't saved to maybe pray and receive Christ, you pray that prayer and you think every night I'm going to go to bed, I'm going to pray that prayer for Jesus to save me. Look, you pray the prayer, you ask Christ to save you one time. If you believe it in your heart, the Bible says you're saved. You don't have to keep praying over and over, Lord, save me. When Peter said, Lord, save me, God pulled, Jesus pulled him up. He didn't have to say, Lord, save me, 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 Lord, save me. It's not based on your words of your prayer. It's based on belief in your heart. person comes down to the altar to get saved. As they're walking down, they're in faith, believing they're saved before they ever kneel and pray a prayer. Amen. 
If you believe lordship and salvation, you'll condemn yourself. You'll make multiple professions of faith until you feel it. Now, if you want to reject this heresy, which I think you ought to, you know what you can do? You can walk in liberty. And you know what I think you can do? And I think we kind of heard a little bit. I heard some amens when we talk about the grace of God. I think you can really appreciate the grace of God. Because you realize it's not by works of righteousness which you've done. The Lord didn't save me and say, you know what? He'd make a good person on my team. He's so smart and he's so good looking. He's so talented. I just really want him to be saved. You know what? If God never saved you, if he blew the world up right now and everybody went out, ceased out of, out of existence, God would still be God. Still be trucking right along. Wouldn't change him, affect him a bit. The only way you're going to be to add to him is when you get to heaven one day. And if you've done something for Christ and you earn a crown, works which are rewards, which is different than earning your salvation. This has to do with your discipleship. Earning rewards, then you can maybe throw a crown at his feet, and then when he wears those many crowns, he might have one more crown on his head than he had before. It says he wears many crowns, Revelation 19. That's the only thing you can add to him. That's your life. Given it. He gave you life, then he gave you eternal life. You can give it back to him. That's the only thing you can give to God. And you do it because of appreciation, because of His amazing grace. Because, ladies and gentlemen, had not it been the almighty grace of God, none of us would be saved, none of us would be on our way to heaven, none of us would even be here in church.